I'll also show you one example on the use of separation of variables. Um, these, these problems are usually pretty lengthy in solution and require special care, so I will go over one of them in detail. Uh, we have here um, uh, a problem. We have two electrodes. Uh, these are infinite. They are infinite in the z-direction. I'm just showing you here the y and the x-plane. This is the x-y plane, okay? So they are infinite in the z-direction. Uh, they are both kept at zero potential, okay? And it's open, the, the, the structure is open from this side. You can see they are extending also in the x direction. So they go to infinity also in the x direction. And at x equal to zero, we have an electrode which is kept at a potential V node. And notice that these two, the, the zero electrodes and V node electrode, they are, they are insulated from one another. So there is, there is some insulation here. They are not touching one another. And my, our target is to find V everywhere. Find V everywhere within this uh, structure. And of course, unless otherwise stated, you take, of course, epsilon, epsilon node within your domain. So there is no dielectric inside the, inside the domain. Here, because the uh, number of things should notice immediately, uh, because of the uh, extension, infinite extension, the Z direction, the solution will not depend on Z. It's, 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 it's really a two-dimensional problem. The field will be the same for any, any cross-section in Z. So just keep in mind, this one here is the x-axis, and this one here is the y-axis is stated, this is the x-y plane. Now, because the v, v here is in general expected to be a function of x and y, so v will be a, v will be a function of x and y, and because I have two, two coordinates that control the potential, I have to apply uh, separation of variables. And I'll go over this example with you to see how separation of variables is applied is applied here. We want, of course, to solve Laplace equation in this region because there is no volumetric charge density. If there is any charge, it's going to be a surface charge density on the plate. This is the equation that we want to solve. So we want to determine V as a function of X and Y. So what you will assume here, you assume that V is, is a product of two functions, capital X and uh, capital X is only a function of small x and capital Y is only a function of small y, okay? So we assume that V can be written as a, as a product of two functions, X, which is only a function of X, and Y, which is only a function of Y. And from now on, I'm not going to be mentioning the coordinates. These will be the functions. So what you do if you take this expression and you put it substitute here, you will see that y, y cannot be differentiated relative to x, so I can simply take it out. So this will give me y multiplied by the second derivative of the function x. If I take this expression and substitute it here, because x is not a function of y, I can take x out and end up with the second derivative of y relative to y. y the function y relative to the coordinate y. So this is what you'll have here. Notice what's happening. These are all functions. These are not coordinates. So here is y multiplied by the second derivative of the function x relative to the coordinate x plus the function x multiplied by the second derivative of the function y relative to the coordinate y. This is equal to zero. And the next step, uh, and the same thing we'll do, of course, if we have z dependency. The next step is to divide by uh, x and y, the product of x and y. So this will give you here x double dash divided by x. This will give you y double dash divided by y. So this is now the expression that we have. x double dash divided by x plus y double dash divided by y is equal to zero. And because these two functions are independent of one another, each one of these terms, this term and this term, must be equal to a constant. And because they are both sum to zero, this constant and this constant sum to zero, one of them will have to be positive, the other one will have to be negative. And we'll see how we are going to make this choice now in a second. So for now, we'll assume that they are both equal to minus kx squared. And by the way, minus kx squared or minus ky squared does not necessarily mean that it is positive. Because kx can be an imaginary number. And in that case, if it's an imaginary number, say like... Uh, uh, j5, say j5, if you square it, you get minus 25. So, um, so this, this really summarizes the general case. So one of them will have to be real, the other one will have to be imaginary in order for this equation to be satisfied. And the reason is, this is, this is some number, this is another number, 
One of these two numbers will have to be negative, the other is positive, and they are equal in magnitude to cancel to give you zero. So for now, we'll assume we will take this x double dash and x over x, which is really the function, the second derivative of the function divided by itself, will equate it to minus kx squared. And when you multiply both sides by x and move x to the other side, you obtain this equation. We do exactly the same here. Now, I have a word of warning for you here. This, this equation, I'm trying now to solve for a function k, for a function x, uh, when you differentiate it to the respect to x two times, and you multiply it by kx squared, you get zero. If kx is real, if kx is real, so kx squared is a positive number, in that case, the solution of this equation is a cosine and sine. This is a very simple calculus that this will give you cosine kx x uh, factor. Um, let me just erase this one here. Plus, uh, we'll give you a sine as well. Plus, uh, some constant multiplied by sine kx x. So if kx is positive, is a real number, then this is what you're going to be getting. This will give you a, a cosine kx x plus b sine kx x. What if a kx is imaginary? If kx is imaginary, then kx squared is a negative number. And in that case, x will be the sum of uh, exponentials. So here in that case, a will give, you a, will give you the solution. a to the minus kx x plus b to the, to the plus kx x. So you get the sum of two exponents. One of them was positive uh, sine, positive sine, the other one was negative sine. So these two solutions are both positive depending on your assumption. Now, for the example that we have seen, we know that if you move away from the electrode, the field should decay, that the potential should get weaker. So um, we, we cannot really uh, have uh, an, an infinitely growing solution. So because remember this one grows with x and the x goes to infinity. So if you put a solution like this, then the potential will be infinite at infinity. So this part must be rejected. It does not apply to this problem. Now, can it be sine and cosine with respect to x? No, it can be sine and cosine because as we said, if you move away from the, the, the main electrode, we have an electrode here, it's giving you V naught. So it makes sense physically as you move away from this electrode in the x direction, the voltage should decay, should become weaker. So the, the only logical uh, dependence here on, on x should be e to the minus kxx. It cannot be a cosine, it cannot be a sine, it cannot be a growing exponential, okay? So here, because of the, of the physical constraints of the problem, what I'm going to be doing, I will select kx to be uh, imaginary, and I will pick only the negative exponent. And because I selected kx to be imaginary, this means that ky squared will be a positive number, and ky will give us cosine and sine. Ky will give us cosine and sine. So these are the only possible solutions. So this is very important step in separation of variables. After you separated the variables as I did here, and then you start to say, okay, this must be a constant, this must be a constant. I'm going to be summing them together. Which one is going to be real? Which one is going to be imaginary? This, this, this should appear as a function of the, uh, as a, as a, or as a result of the topology of the problem and the physics of the problem. So here we agreed kx is going to be imaginary, so then kx squared is negative, and this will result in the decaying exponential for x. While for y, because kx now is imaginary, then ky squared is positive, because they must cancel out. Remember, this is kx squared, this is ky squared. They must cancel out. Then ky squared is positive, which means that y is a cosine and sine. Now let's take a look at y. Here, y is equal to 0 on this plate. On this plate here, this is y equal to 0. And this y is equal to b here. This b. Because if you assume a cosine, then the value must be 0 when you put y equal to 0. But the cosine is equal to 1 when y is equal to 0. Then the cosine is not an acceptable no a solution for y. It's only a sign. So it gives you 0 here, and then it gives you a 0 here. So now we, we rejected the cosine as well because of the boundary condition. Because when you put y equal to 0 on this electrode, 
you must get the V equal to zero. When you do that, then the solution for Y cannot have a cosine. It cannot have a cosine. So now we know we, we picked one possible solution for X, or actually the only visible solution, which is the decaying exponential. And we picked the only possible solution for Y, which is sine KYY. Of course, I'm writing here everything in terms of X, but effectively it, the same applies. So, as I said, KX and KY, it depends on the problem. One of them can be real, the other one can be imaginary. Uh, because of the, uh, of the nature of this problem, we selected, we selected KX to be a negative number, an, an imaginary number. So then its square will give us a negative number. Then the negative of X squared will give us a positive number. So, we said now that k y squared will be equal to minus k a squared will be equal to k squared. So k is a is a is a is a positive number. Okay. So we said that k y squared is positive, while k x squared is negative because we assume that k x is imaginary. Now this means we'll we'll now get rid of get rid of k x and k y because they are both related to k. Uh, k in, in reality, actually, what we said here, we said that k y is equal to k, where k is a positive, is a, is, a, is a real number, and we said that k x is equal to minus j k, or j, j k, doesn't matter, j k. So we eliminated both of them, and now we'll talk about only one parameter, which we call k. So what is happening now? Uh, the solution for y, as we agreed, can be cosine or sine, but we rejected the cosine, because the boundary condition when y is equal to 0 must give you 0. So we kept only the sine part. And for the x, we will keep only the decaying exponential because we selected kx to be imaginary. For x, you can get either e to the minus kxx or you get e to the kxx. But e to the kxx is not physical because the solution will grow to infinity as x goes to infinity. So for a structure like this, you cannot have a growing exponential. Then we keep only the decaying exponential for x. So now the dependence on x, as we agreed, is equal to a constant multiplied by e to the minus kx, kx. But we, from the very beginning, we said that the potential is the product of the y function multiplied by the x function. So now this is one possible solution for this problem. A constant, e to the minus kx, sine ky. But what is k and what is a constant? So now we use separation of variables. To, to get to the point where the solution is expressed in terms of two parameters, k and c. But what is k, k and what is c? And notice here I put an index here n, and I will show you why I did that. Because there are actually, this problem has actually infinite number of solutions. And in order to get the total, the, the, the one unique solution, it is going to be a com com um, linear combination of all these solutions that you will see in a second. So now let's see how we can apply that. Start now to apply the boundary conditions. Uh, just keep in mind the shape of the of the structure we have. Uh, this is here uh, y. This is x. Here we have v naught. This is zero. This is zero. Okay. And uh, we said that when you put uh, y equal to zero here, so on this plate you get zero voltage. You put y equal to zero, you get zero voltage. When we put y equal to zero here, we eliminate the cosine term. We said we cannot have a cosine term. Now, when you put y equal to b, you must get zero. Then sine kb must be equal to zero. But this means that kb must be a multiple of uh, pi, must be equal to n pi, which means that k cannot assume any value. k must be n pi over b, n pi over b. And by the way, this derivation is very is very um, common in electromagnetics, and you'll see when we talk about waveguides, uh, you get all these type of modes appearing, and you get this index. So for every n, you get one possible solution. And the, 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 the complete solution for this problem is the sum of all solutions that you will get. It depends on the boundary condition. Remember that these solutions do not satisfy all boundary conditions. So there is no conflict with the uniqueness theorem. The uniqueness theorem is saying if your solution satisfies all boundary conditions, then it is, it is a solution. This just satisfies one of the boundary conditions. So now we know that the k cannot be any number. k is n by over b. So now our solution is this one. Uh, Cn e to the minus n by x over b 
sine n by y over b. And someone may ask, what, why did we select n to be only uh, positive and we did, we did not select n to be negative? Because if you select n to be negative, then you will result here in a, in a growing exponential, which becomes again non-physical. So the only possible physical solution is k equal to n by over b and n is positive. Of course, if you put n equal to 0, you get 0. So it's, it's not really included. So n has to be a positive integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinity. Now, this is one possible solution, and all these solutions are valid. In order to get the complete solution, what you have to do, you have to sum all these solutions from 1 to infinity. And now, we know what is what is k. We already know k. k is n by over b, and this depends on n. So what, what is the coefficient for each one of these sub-solutions? What is the coefficient? We have to apply the boundary condition that we have not used yet. That when x is equal to 0, when you put x here equal to 0, you get v equal to v naught. This is, uh, this is one boundary condition we have not applied. So now we'll go, come back here, we put x equal to 0, this will give us here 1. This will be equal, v will be equal to v naught. So the last step in our solution is to put x equal to 0, as I said. So this is what we did. The exponential term disappeared. We have only this term. So v naught is equal to this expansion, and this looks like a Fourier expansion, correct? v naught is equal to the summation of sum of sinusoidals. And uh, as you know from your study in, um, in, uh, in Fourier analysis, you multiply both sides by sine m by over b and uh, integrate from 0 to b in order to get uh, the, or use the orthogonality of sine terms. So what I do here, I multiply both sides, this side and this side, by sine m by over b, and then integrate from 0 to b, and then I move the integration into the summation. Okay, this integral here will give us b over 2 only if m is equal to n, and then it will give us 0 otherwise. The integral of uh, v naught multiplied by sine m by, m by y over b will give you only a value if m is odd. Because the, if, you, if you get the area under a complete sign or multiples of a complete sign, it is zero. But the area over half a sign is positive or negative, depending on the sign, correct? So here you will see that we can get an answer depending on the whether um, n is positive or, or uh, uh, sorry, is odd or even. So to summarize, this integral here for v naught will give you an answer only if uh, m is odd. If m is even, you get 0. And the answer of m is odd, you can try that, is 2b over m by multiplied by v naught. The left-hand side, the other integral containing the, the two signs will give you a b over 2 answer, only if m is equal to n, so you multiply by cn. So when you equate this one to this one, you will see that every b will cancel with b, 2 will go here, becomes 4. You will see that cn, the coefficient of the expansion that we are looking for, are equal to 4 v naught over n by only if n is odd and it is 0 otherwise. So we now know that our solution can be written as the sum of odd n terms. So first we selected k, k turned to be out, out to be uh, n by over b. And we said n can be 1, 2, 3, and 4. But when we want to calculate the coefficients, we found out that only the odd n will remain and the n, the, 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 even, the even n must disappear because of the boundary condition. So if you put all this together, you get the final shape of your answer. So now, if we put everything together, this is our answer here. The solution we're looking for that satisfies all the boundary conditions, that satisfies the Laplace equation, is 4 v naught over by n was, was, was still inside the in summation. We're summing only over n odd, so n equal to 1, 3, 5, and so on. e to the minus n by x over b sine n by y over b. This is really our general solution here. It satisfies the boundary conditions, it satisfies Laplace equation, and it is a unique solution. So this is a complete example of how to apply, we apply a Laplace equation, and you can see it takes time, and you have to be extremely careful. You have to determine based on the physics whether to keep these coefficients real, should kx be real, should it be imaginary, uh, should the solution along x be decaying? Should it be sinusoidal? Which solutions will be eliminated by boundary conditions? You have to be extremely careful when you apply all this in this, uh, this type of separation of variables problem.